So next, uh, we got into the meat of the actual course. And so this was how to start learning a language. Now, Tim Ferriss uh, is famous for brain hacking, body hacking, work hacking, uh, getting all these hacks to be able to do things more efficiently. And he actually put his money where his mouth was and went out and learned Japanese and now other languages. And he does this thing that's called uh, deconstructing language. And just like we did in the first bit when we did this, or, s, a, m, n, and learning these patterns, recognizing patterns, he came up with 12 sentences, and he calls them the 12 golden sens sentences that help him to start to structure a language together. Now, I can testify to this, because this is very similar to what I would do, say I was learning a language. Um, but say you go to a, uh, a dinner party and there's somebody that speaks a language that you don't speak and you want to learn it, and the person doesn't mind you asking about it, they'll probably be happy. Um, you can start asking these questions and then starting to predict what their language is going to sound like. Um, and so, uh, just before that, I came up, I, I, I showed these two sayings. So, language is not a gift, it's a mindset. And so, this is all part of, the, that's my quote. I hate people who quote themselves, but there you go. I quote myself. Uh, language is a mindset. Uh, you, you've got to be thinking constantly. Your mind's always functioning, putting it together. So if this is this, then what would that be? If this is this, then, oh, I guess you would say this like that. And then if someone says, well, no, actually it's this. Okay, bang. And I'm, it's constantly rejigging your mind and the language slowly, slowly builds and builds more and more, gets closer to perfection, but never hits perfection. And then the other thing is language learning is a contact sport. That is that you cannot learn a language just through reading or just through studying the rules. You need to get it into your body, get your muscles involved. You need to hurt. You need to make mistakes. You need to correct things. It's a contact sport. Um, and so these sentences, the first six. Now, speaking the languages that I do, I saw that one, when you look at these sentences, yeah, they're, they're good, but there are some things that I would tweak, especially if learning languages of Asia. One thing that you notice, uh, the apple is red, the. Concepts like the, 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 or an apple, the apple, these are called the articles. The is the definite article, a indefinite article, so an apple is red is indefinite, because we don't know which apple. The apple is the apple. In languages, say, Indonesian, apple berwarna merah. You, we have no such word as the. Um, Thai, apple sidang, the apple is red. What we do have, though, is this and that. And so what I did is I shifted them to this. So... I can say, this apple is red. Apple ini berwarna merah. This apple is red. This apple is red in Chinese. Apple uh, This apple is red. And so, putting the this in actually gives you more structures that are more relevant within Asian languages, at least for many of the languages of this part of the world. So, I changed... Tim Ferriss's original the and a uh, in many cases to this instead. And you can substitute it for this or that. So this apple is red. This is John's apple. I give John an apple. We give him the apple. He gives an apple to John. She gives the apple to him. Now, these structures are actually fascinating across, um, especially like languages like Chinese, Thai, because we do things in different ways. And you can still see that there's the in there. Even Russian doesn't use the. Um, you give him apple. Apple. Uh, you don't say the apple. Uh, but in translating these sentences, I guess you would see that, oh, they don't use the word the. Um, the question was, what do you learn from these sentences? And I want you to think yourself, what do you actually learn from each of these? and write them down. Each one of these sentences teaches you one or more different structures. Um, different languages, they're going to be more relevant. Um, now, one thing to note here, have a look at number four and five. We give him the apple. He gives an apple to John. They mightn't seem that different, but in several languages, 
they're very different. We give him the apple. Okay. Um, take this sentence though, for example. John gives Harry his hat. Whose hat was it? Was it John's or Harry's? In English, there's no way that you can know whose hat it was. But in some languages, they will actually put the word his in different forms. So you know whether it was John's or Harry's hat. So these kind of structures can tell us a lot. And English is actually pretty crappy language as a base language to be able to get other meanings. There are some other languages that actually would have more granular meaning, but these can teach you a lot. Um, the next sentences, is the apple red? The apples are red. You could say these apples are red. I must give the apple to him. I want to give the apple to her. I'm going to know tomorrow. I can't eat the apple. The only one sort of different there is number 11. I'm going to know tomorrow. And um, there are different ways of saying that. Um, but they can teach you different structures. Now, one thing that we learned in class, though, was that, yeah, sure, you might be able to do a Google Translate on these or even ask a native speaker. However, if you are a native speaker, the way that you would say these sentences in a native context, just in full flow conversation versus you've got some foreigner asking you, how do you say this? And you, you tell them, you will often tell somebody how you say it as a more formal or correct way, but the way that people actually say it will be very different. And so this is one thing that we get from all of these 12 sentences is that realize that it's just a guide and where you get the language specimens from is gonna make a world of difference. If it's just Google Translate, dictionaries, or official translations, that's one thing. If you get them from the wild and you're actually able to extract the language that people are actually using without them realizing that you're teaching you is going to be much, much more powerful, but it's a little bit more difficult to create that circumstance where you're getting that language, but that's the best language because that's the language that people really use. So how would we do it better? I guess one thing would be to get specimens of the language that people are telling you. Um, I get the, the very bottom rung is Google Translate. Next is getting asking people. And then to do it even better is then to get a version of the language where you extract it from its natural environment and you analyze it that way. And then the most amazing thing to do would be to get all three of those and compare them against each other and have a look at what officially they say about the language versus what's really said. And in between comparing those is where your real learning is gonna come from. And if you're able to adapt all of those and start to understand when to use which one, you're going to get a facility in that language that very few foreign learners of that language get.